All right. Hello. Um, my name is Vivian Kwan. I am a lawyer practicing in Malaysia. I'm a litigation partner at a firm called Nick Hussein and Partners, and I am a member of the Young Commonwealth Lawyers Association. Now, as part of the Young Commonwealth Lawyers Committee, uh, that we have this in conversation series, and today I have the tremendous pleasure of speaking with the honorary life president of the Commonwealth Lawyers Association and current council member, Colin Nicole Skilsey. Now, Colin is a barrister and bencher of Grace Inn. He was a recorder of Crown Courts from 1983 to 1998 and was licensed to sit as a judge at the Central Criminal Court of England and Wales, commonly known as the Old Bailey. He was president of the Commonwealth Lawyers Association from 2003 to 2005 and was elected its life president in 2007. Colin, thank you so much for carving out the time to have a chat with me today. All right, let's dive into our um, recording and interview. Colin, where and in what capacity do you practice? I'm a member of uh, a set of chambers, the three Raymond buildings in uh, Gray's Inn in London, um, a uh, leading set of chambers that has an international reputation in criminal, regulatory, and public law cases. The chambers have uh, existed since 1926. Right. And Legal 500 has acclaimed you as a leading authority on corruption. You are a barrister with significant experience in high profile complex commercial crime cases, extradition, criminal mutual assistance, human rights and war crimes. So how did you come to specialize in these areas? The acclamation as a leading authority on corruption uh, probably is because uh, I'm the lead author of a 900 page book on corruption and most importantly, Misuse of Public Office, that is now in its third edition. Um, I was called to the bar 64 years ago in 1957, and so I've seen a lot of changes. In the early years, I prosecuted and defended in criminal trials, mainly at the Old Bailey, and in courts outside London. In the early 1970s, I was briefed as junior counsel in an extradition case in the House of Lords, then our Supreme Court, involving the attempted assassination of the son of the Chinese leader, Chiang Kai-shek. As the demand for extradition increased, I received more cases, my practice became more international and extended to human rights and ultimately to war crimes. In the uh, late um, uh, in, sorry, I've defended in a number of high profile cases, including uh, the defense of the Pakistani businessman at the center of the bank and credit, um, of credit and commerce scandal. Right. Wow. You're, you're, you have such a vast uh, international experience and it includes advising governments and private clients in cases, um, I believe in 14 different countries including appearing as lead counsel in Hong Kong, in Gibraltar, and St. Helena. And you've also been permitted to address the court as an advocate in the States, in the US. Was it a challenge familiarizing with and navigating through these different legal systems and governing laws? I was always instructed by an English solicitor. And I worked with lawyers in any event in the overseas jurisdiction. Researching overseas laws, particularly in the Commonwealth Island uh, territories, can be very difficult. Interestingly, as in the Guantanamo Bay hearings in the United States, the correct interpretation of the common law can sometimes provide the most unexpected solutions. Right. Could you please share with us uh, one or two high points of your career? In three cases between 1984 and 1989, 
I represented fugitives whose extradition from the UK was sought for capital murder in the United States. And they risked the death penalty and significantly the risk of the death row phenomenon. The US-UK extradition treaty provided that the UK could request an assurance that the death penalty would not be carried out. In each case, the assurance provided was patently inadequate. The only answer, and it was novel at the time, was to apply to the European Court of Human Rights to ban the extradition on the basis of death row. I failed in the first two cases. I succeeded in the third, the Sewing case. In the unanimous ruling of uh, 18 judges of the court ruled that extradition would amount to inhuman and degrading treatment and violate the convention. Even though, and this was most important, the risk of death row would be inflicted by a non-member state. The Suring case changed forever the relation between extradition and human rights in Europe and was subsequently applied to deportation and asylum cases and other articles of the convention, including fair trial. The Suring principles that came to be known quickly resonated throughout the Commonwealth and was followed by a series of decisions in the Privy Council and hundreds of executions were immediately blocked on the basis of the death row phenomenon. There followed cases on mandatory death penalties and needed subsequently the death penalty itself. The result is that no longer can governments remove aliens from their territories without appreciation of their human rights obligations. The wow. second of my high points is intervening on behalf of the uh, Commonwealth Lawyers Association with Sir Sidney Kentridge QC and Timothy QC in the hearing of the first of the Guantanamo Bay habeas corpus appeals in the US Supreme Court in 2004. CLA submitted a brief in writing, but the government failed to respond and we thought we'd been ignored. Unlike other interveners, who advanced human rights and international law issues, the CLA's brief focused on the lower court's misunderstanding of English habeas corpus law. We were delighted, Sydney, Tim and I, sitting in the well of the court, when Justice Briars, one of the judges, asked the Attorney General what he had to say about these 400 years of English law. The government had no answer. And when we read the judgment, we realized the CLA's argument had succeeded. And may I, even though not invited, add a third high point. And that was my election in Nairobi as life president of the CLA. I had absolutely no idea it was going to happen. I was asked to leave the uh, general meeting and then eventually I was allowed to return and they told me I've been elected. I think I made the most impromptu speech that I've ever made. Wow, Colin, that was, I think, really insightful and you've been so immense, part of so many interesting and groundbreaking cases. Could you share with us um, a few um, funny moments you have as a lawyer? My identical twin brother, who was also a QC and what led in the uh, Pinochet case. We were sworn as, in as recorders, that is part-time judges, in a packed courtroom in Winchester in England. First, I was called into the court. I was sworn in and left the court. Then my twin was called into the court and he was sworn in. The judge, Realizing it looked as if the same person had been sworn in twice, then had to explain to the courtroom exactly what had happened. <laughs> right, and, and what was your worst moment um, in court or in practice? Being late for hearing before the House of Lords in our Supreme Court. 
the Judicial Committee of the House of Lords sat earlier than usual, and there was a failure of communication on the time it was due to sit. I arrived late, and the fearsome Lord Diplock, and indeed he was fearsome, presiding, asked me, what is the explanation for this? Irrespective of the rights and wrongs of the situation, I shouldered all the blame myself. The judges approved, and I was given an excellent hearing. It turned out later the fault was a failure of the printing system. Right. I'm sure like any good barrister, well experienced, you recovered very quickly from that. Um, how long have you been a member of the CLA, um, the Commonwealth Lawyers Association, and how did you first get involved? I've been a, a member of the CLA uh, for 35 years since uh, its establishment. In 1983, my brother and I attended the uh, Commonwealth Law Conference in Hong Kong, a magnificent uh, occasion. Three years later, we attended the conference, the first under the auspices of the CLA in Ocherias in Jamaica. On our return to London, we were told the Bar Council of England Wales had nominated both of us as vice presidents. There could only be one of us. And the result was that I accepted and I've involved it, been involved in ever since. Right. And I'm sure you've been involved in the very uh, popular Commonwealth conference, law conference. Could you share a little bit about your experiences at the, these uh, Commonwealth law conferences? I've attended 12 of the 18 conferences that I could have attended. Unfortunately, wow. seeing the last two in Zambia and in Nassau. Uh, the, what has impressed me most is the magnificence of the occasion and the warmth of the hospitality that we receive from our host countries and, of course, our host bar associations. It was Saris Das, my predecessor as uh, president of the CLA, um, who rightly described, and of course he's from Malaysia, who rightly described the conferences as the most prestigious in the Commonwealth's legal year. Every two years, gathering of its legal professionals, public and private lawyers, judges, academics, and legal executives on an equal basis to discuss problems of mutual interest and problems of special interest. An opportunity to stand back, listen to some of the professor's legal minds, and engage with fellow lawyers on uh, the system issues affecting the profession as a whole. Uh, I, um, in the early years, uh, uh, spoke at the breakout sessions on uh, death penalty, uh, extradition, uh, rule of law, issues of that kind. And of course, much later was involved much more in the administration of the conferences. But they're great occasions. And the wonderful thing is that you can take not only your wife and partner, but you can take your children as well you can go on all sorts of trips, and uh, they really are something to remember. Indeed, Colin. Now, apart from other, um, I mean, apart from the Commonwealth uh, Lawyers Conference, what other CLA events or activities have you been involved in? Well, the most significant one, of course, is the uh, uh, development and uh, implementation of the Adam House principles on the separation of powers. They began with the colloquium in uh, 1999 in Buckinghamshire, and ultimately, of course, after a great deal of work, they uh, uh, led to the adoption of the principles in, uh, in uh, Abuja, in Nigeria, and were eventually incorporated in the, the uh, Commonwealth Charter. But the great thing about that um, activity, the great thing about the uh, 
principles is that they were the result of a collaboration of the uh, Commonwealth lawyers, the Commonwealth judges, magistrates and judges association, Commonwealth Legal Education Association, that's the academics, of course, and uh, the Commonwealth Parliamentary Association, one occasion when we joined with them. But uh, that, was, um, that was a great activity to be involved in. And of course, it's one in which I continue to be involved in. Uh, there are, of course, other issues that I've been involved in, but perhaps I can tell you about those later. Right. And that's a perfect segue into my next question. Is there an area which is a particular issue within the Commonwealth that you have an interest in or have worked on? Well, I participated in all sorts of meetings and conferences on rule of law, judicial independence, corruption, of course, which is nowadays my special subject, and uh, in more recent years in uh, cybercrime and virtual currencies. Uh, since 2013, I have uh, chaired the, uh, the uh, Commonwealth Sex Expert Group on Cybercrime and the part, then the Commonwealth Expert Group on the Virtual Currencies. And um, I've also uh, assisted on uh, corruption um, issues. Wow, Colin, such an amazing career you have. Um, apart from having an illustrious legal career, I hear you're also an avid painter. Your artwork was exhibited in the Royal Hibernian Academy, the Royal Institute of All Painters, and the New English Art Club. And you were a governor of the Federation of British Artists from 2001 to 2007. Tell us how you picked up painting and do you still paint? I see some brushes behind you, Colin, and some artwork on your left as well. I've always painted, ever since I was a child. Uh, the problem has always been that since um, I came to the bar, I had to make a decision as to which was going to come first. And the result was that my painting really was very much limited to holidays with the children when they allowed it. And uh, secretly at Commonwealth Law Conferences, sitting in the back of the breakout sessions, uh, making drawings of those who were present. Uh, but. Uh, more recently, of course, I've had much more time, particularly since the COVID lockdown. And I've done a lot of painting in the last uh, couple of years, and I continue to do so, and I hope I always will. If I'd not been a lawyer, I suppose I would have been a painter. And I'm sure a, a very successful one at it, Colin. Now, Colin, how would you like to be remembered. You've come a long way, such a long and uh, rewarding career you have. How would you like uh, to be remembered by uh, the members of the bar or even family and friends? I think I'd like to be remembered as one of two twin barristers who contributed in seminal cases to the development of changes in the law and also the uh, improvement of uh, human rights obligations. And I would also like to think, and like to hope maybe, that those with whom I worked over the years, the wonderful people with whom I've worked in our profession, that they will uh, have enjoyed working with me as much as I've enjoyed working with them. Wonderful. Now, Colin, my last question to you, uh, which I think is a wonderful cap to this um, interview and chat we have. What advice would you give anyone who aspires to be a lawyer or who wants a career in law or even young lawyer? I would suggest that they uh, really want to be lawyers. They're satisfied that they want to be lawyers that uh, they make their choices as the area in which they wish to work, and that they uh, 
provide a good mentor, either a firm or in a set of chambers, somebody with whom they do a pupillage, so that they uh, know what they really want to do and what they have to face. And uh, I would also say that it's profession, the workers, certainly as a barrister and as a, as a lawyer, and you know this, um, is very demanding. And uh, so it's terribly important to consider the, uh, the welfare of the family and to ensure that you play a full part in the private life as well as in the working life. Really sound and solid advice there, Colin. Thank you so much. And on behalf of the Commonwealth Florist Association, once again, I would like to thank Colin, Colin Nichols QC, the Honorary Life President of the Commonwealth Florist Association and current council member for allowing me and those that are watching this recording, a wonderful glimpse into his impactful, inspiring and colorful career. Thank you, Colin.